Hello friends, this this is Nate with Exley Theories coming back for, for Lesson 3 of our Beekeeping 101 Crash Course. I'm really excited that you guys are here. We've been having some fun with these previous lessons. I hope that y'all are getting a lot out of them. Today we're going to talk, talk about tools of, of the trade. We've got that components, components, specifically for your standard length 5, five which is probably where you'll be starting out and recommend recommend you start. Um, then we'll also look at other hive types because there are option, options for selling straw, straw hive that have different pros and, pros and cons. Uh, uh, we'll look not just, just at the Langstroth hive, but at the top bar hive, the Ware hive, and all these cool observation hives. After we go over those, we'll go over the essential tool list of the essentials that you need to get started. Uh, just cutting out the fluff and looking at what is it that you need to have in your toolbox when you first step into your apiary as a new beekeeper. So let's get started. So this first hive is the Langstroth hive and uh, it's the most common hive you're going to come across but that's one of the reasons why it's important to dissect it a little bit and look at the different components. So first part, let's start from the top and work our way down. The top is obviously the lid, but they call it an outer cover, and it is a telescoping lid, which means it slides down around the top of whatever box you have on top. And that's important because that uh, that that those sides keep that lid from warping and creating any cracks, which would allow for drafts or for moisture to get in. If you're building your own Langstroth hive, it is totally fine to just take a piece of plywood cut it to size, and slap it on top of your beehive. But if you do that, you have to make sure that you have painted and sealed that piece of plywood like no other piece of that box because it is going to be taking the main beating for that hive, whether it's UV rays or rain or hail or whatever you have in your area. The, the, the main reason you want to make sure it's solid is not just because of the beating it's going to be taking, but also because if it warps, and allows moisture to come in or heat to escape, it's really going to be a setback for your hive. Um, moisture in the beehive can really be a deadly thing. During the winter, that cluster has to stay warm, and as they're creating that warmth, it rises as heat does. When it hits that cold lid, it'll the, the, the moisture in the air will condensate, create water droplets, and those water droplets will drop back down onto that cluster and it'll actually kill your bees off. So it's even worse when that lid is warped such that there's a crack in between that top box and the lid and that allows a draft, or it allows rain to drip down the inside of the box. It's just adding extra unnecessary and even dangerous moisture to your beehive. So whatever lid you use, whether it's a telescoping outer cover lid or if it's just a simple piece of plywood with a rock on top of it, make sure that it's fit for the job. Now the inner cover is the next piece that's underneath it, and for the longest time I never knew what these things were for. But it turns out that the inner cover prevents the bees from building comb that bridges the gap from the tops of your frames to the bottom of your lid. And the reason that's significant, and, and by the way, that kind of comb is called burr comb. When, when bees bridge gaps in places other than what you've intended for them to build it on, that's called burr comb. And it's just ex extraneous comb that they build all over the place for different reasons. And it's 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 uh, something that you can harvest, but it also creates a, a sticky situation because when they attach the tops of the frames to the bottom of your lid and you try to take that lid off, then you end up taking frames out with it because the frames are attached to the lid. So this inner cover helps prevent that. It also works for the uh, propolis when they glue things together with their propolis. So that's the purpose of the inner cover. It's not strictly necessary. It just helps for removing that lid without lifting up a bunch of frames at the same time because they happen to be attached to the lid. Moving to the next box down are the honey supers. And just like their name suggests, this is where your honey is going to be. The, uh, the only reason that the honey is in these boxes is instead of in the lower box is really because of the queen excluder, the next part down. The queen excluder prevents the queen from going up into the supers and laying eggs in that comb. Because uh, once she does that, then it becomes brood and, and then it's not really it's not really extractable anymore. Um, it, it, 
basically gets rid of your ability to harvest those boxes because now she's using it for brood instead of filling it with honey. So we use an artificial separator called a queen excluder and it basically is a mesh that's big enough for bees to fit through, the worker bees to fit through, but small enough to where the queen can't fit through because she's built a little bit differently. The last box is at the bottom and it's the deep super. It's a little larger because it's meant to house the, the main bulk of the hive's powerhouse, their, their brood chamber. Um, I, would, I would like to see, for, for me, a strong hive is two deep supers and then any amount of honey supers on top. If you have that double powerhouse of two deep supers down there and the queen is strong enough to keep them both full, you've got a good thing going. They'll put uh, a lot of bees, that, that'll be a lot of horsepower, a lot of bee power, and make a lot of honey and, and keep their hive safe and, and strong. So that's the deep super. The second to last part is the bottom board. That's just the floor. Uh, you'll notice that in this diagram it's solid. I would encourage you to look into getting a screened bottom board. And a screened bottom board is just a floor that has a 1 8 inch hardware cloth on the bottom instead of a solid plank. And if you were here for lesson three, where we talked about pests and diseases, the screened bottom board is a significant integrated pest management system to manage varroa mites. And varroa mites are like fleas on bees. They significantly reduce the health and, and uh, uh, strength of, of your hives. But if you have this, this screen bottom board on there, when they fall off the bee, rather than falling onto a solid floor where they can get back up onto a bee, they fall through the mesh and onto the ground where they can't get back into the hive. So that's the idea behind a screened bottom board. I would recommend screened bottom boards. Lastly is the stand. This one is kind of extraneous. It's nice to have it, that front porch, because uh, that front porch will catch stuff that they're bringing in and out of the hives. Like you might see some excrement on there if they're uh, not, not having the best day, <laughs> or you'll see pollen pollen packets that have rolled down the front porch that some bee accidentally dropped or you'll see carcasses of drones that they've dragged out or, or dead bees it's a great place to look to get an idea of what's going on in the hive because when they drag it out the front door and drop it on the front porch that stand will roll it down to the front and you can just kind of look down there and see what's collecting on their doorstep to know what what might be going on inside it's kind of like looking through somebody's trash to know what's going on in their home yeah you might be a creeper for doing it to your neighbor, don't do that, but definitely do it with your bees. The trash is definitely a great way to know what's going on in your hive. So those are the different components of the Langstroth hive. The pros and cons of the Langstroth hive is uh, probably starting with the pros. The, it, the biggest pro is that it is the industry standard. It's what most people are using in their apiaries. And because of that, it's really easy to find the parts that you need to either build your own or um, get a replacement. Also, most of the accessories that are out there are built for Langstroth hives. So it's also easy to transport the frames that are inside the hive. We didn't look at those in the diagram earlier, but it's just the uh, strips of wood that have plastic molded foundation on, in, in them. And that plastic molded foundation is covered, coated with a beeswax layer to make them more uh, attractive to the bees. Those frames encourage or kind of force the bees to construct uniform comb, and that just makes it easier to, for you to inspect. Um, when that comb is uniform and even, and they're not building it all over the place, then you're able to take out one frame and move it, flip it around so you can see both sides without that comb falling off or snapping because it can be kind of brittle as it gets heavier. So that's that's a big pro. The second, the third big pro is that it is the best design for extracting liquid honey. Since they are built on that, the, the comb is built on that plastic foundation, it's easy to take that frame out, pop it into an extractor and spin it around without the, the comb being destroyed. Lastly, it's fairly easy to manipulate and again, that's due to the, the frame structure with their plastic foundation. Now, as far as cons goes, with the Langstroth hive, those individual boxes can be extremely heavy. We're talking up to 80 pounds. And this is uh, this is significant for those of us who might not have as young as a as young of a back as we used to have. 
Uh, also, inspections are invasive, and there's always a risk of rolling the queen while pulling out the frames. And what I mean by that is, as you're pulling out each of these frames, they have a sidebar. And if you're not careful, that sidebar will brush up against the inside wall of, of the hive. Now, if the queen happens to be in between those two, when you brush, brush them up and pull it out, she gets rolled or even squished. And that's a pain because now your bees have to replace her or you have to replace her. It sets them back. And there's if you're letting them requeen naturally, you're running the risk of getting a queen who's not been mated very well. So it's, uh, it's something to watch out for. It's something that I have done several times, and, and that's why I felt like it was appropriate to put here. Also, this is not made, this design, the Langstroth Hive, is not made to produce comb honey. If you want comb honey, you're going to have to put in a specially designed frame for that. Lastly, the frames don't allow for very exciting observation windows because they block the view. And we'll talk about observation windows coming up when we look into observation hives. The top bar hive is the oldest hive design that we know of. There, there's cave paintings of prehistoric people keeping bees in horizontal logs with sticks on top. And this picture right here is a uh, uh, much more developed version than that, not quite, not, not quite as primitive, but still uses the same idea. It's just a long horizontal box, and across the top are bars or, or sticks. And those sticks, those bars, they're perpendicular to the box, and the bees will build their comb down from each of those bars. That's why it's called a top bar hive. But uh, those sticks going perpendicular, uh, perpendicular across the hive is what your bees will be building their comb off of. So there's no foundation, it's just a stick. And this lends itself to some good pros and some considerable cons. Let's look at those. First of all, there's no heavy lifting. There's no 80 pound box that you gotta lift up. That's what makes this a good option for elderly keepers or those who need wheelchair access. It's much more accessible, much more easy to wield. You also uh, won't need foundation, like we mentioned a second ago. The top bars don't need foundation. It'll also allow you to disturb the hive one frame at a time. So, as opposed to the Langstroth hive, where you take the lid off and you expose the whole hive to your inspection, when you take the lid off here, all it does is it shows you the tops of your sticks, or the tops of your bars. Then from there, you take out one bar at a time, you look at your comb, you check your bees, and you can put that bar in, and you're only exposing a little bit of the hive at a time as you're inspecting, which is a good pro. This design can also include observation windows, which is really neat, but it also allows for an even less invasive inspection where you can just open the window and look inside, see how they're doing. And lastly, it also mimics a natural bee space, which is basically a fallen hollow log. Those are some of the pros. So let's look at the cons for the top bar hive. This is definitely a niche hive design, but I will say it is backed by a large community of aficionados who will be more than happy to give you the tips and tricks of the trade to make sure that this design works best for you. So take, take that con with a grain of salt. You can probably make it work. Another con is that the top bars do not guarantee that bees will build uniform combs. Even if your, your sticks, your bars, are going perpendicular to the box, that doesn't mean that your bees are going to build their combs perpendicular to, the, perpendicular to the box. I chose this picture because it's really a nice example of how it should be, but that's not always how it turns out. Um, I had an observation hive that I built, and rather than, rather than them following the orientation of the bars, they decided to build crossways. And it was neat to see how they would have built it naturally, but it was kind of frustrating because now I can't take out one bar and view a piece of comb. I have to do a lot of cutting and, and make a mess in order to get out one bar. So keep that in mind. You're going to have to do a little bit of finagling and probably include some guide foundation just at the top of your bar to make sure and, and help encourage them to build it out straight. Lastly, the top bars allow for comb honey but comb honey is delicate in an extractor and it's not an ideal option for liquid honey. So if your top bars don't have foundation on them and you slip them into an extractor, that spinning might tear them apart depending on the age of the comb. 
So something to consider. You really would only use this for comb honey. Um, other than that, you would probably have to press your honey out of this comb, which isn't a bad thing, but it's definitely more work intensive and your bees are not going to be getting that wax back. You're going to have to keep that wax yourself, which is also not a bad thing in my opinion. Let's talk about the Warre Hive. This one is cool too. It was developed by a monk way back when who wanted to mimic the natural bee space more closely, but instead of doing it in a horizontal hollow log, like with the top bar hive that we just talked about, he was looking at doing it in a vertical hollow tree trunk. So this mimics that environment. And the bees also like it a lot. The, each of these uh, hive body boxes has eight top bars in it. So just like the top bar hive, these utilize the bar or the stick frame as well without any foundation. Each of those boxes is about 40 liters in, in volume, uh, which is a little bit closer to what a natural uh, hollow tree size would be. Uh, but it's not to say that bees won't fill out a bigger or smaller space. They're very versatile and they work with whatever you give them most of the time. Uh, but starting from the top, the roof is much different than the Langstroth hive roof that we looked at earlier. This thing is big. And the reason for that is very much for the same reason that we have uh, the kind of roofs that we do on our own homes. It's for insulation. And the next box down augments that. We call that next box the quilt. And it's usually filled with wood shavings or, or some other loosely packed insulating material. And on the bottom is a top bar cloth. Now this quilt is cool. I wish I wish I used these. We talked about if water gets in the hive, how it can be so detrimental to the bees. Well this quilt is help is is there to help prevent condensation. So your bees keep the hive about 97, I forget if it's 97 or 95 degrees in the brood cluster. And during the winter, that heat will cause condensation as it moves up to the top of the hive. Now, if you just had a normal telescoping lid, as that heat hit that cold lid, it would condensate, the water in the air would condensate, turn into water droplets, and those water droplets would drip back down onto your bees and it would kill them. So the purpose of this quilt is to allow that hot air to kind of have a medium, have an intermediate space where it would go up, it can condensate on those wood chips, and those wood chips will absorb that moisture and retain it instead of letting it drip back down onto your, your uh, hibernating bee cluster. And then it'll also allow that heat to stay in the area, uh, especially with that, that big roof on top, rather than simply hitting that cold lid and then and dissipating out through any cracks that you have. So the quilt is definitely a must have for those of you who are in our northern states uh, and who might have a problem with condensation or exceptionally cold winters. For us here in the south though, it's not really as necessary. If you do put one on, stick with doing a thinner one, like a four inch quilt. Um, farther up north, consider doing a six to eight inch quilt. The boxes down below are the same size. That's another nice feature I feel like about the the War A Hive. Rather than having two sized boxes like the deep bot, the deep super with the Langstroth Hive and the, the the shallow super with the Langstroth Hive, you just have two deeps, and they'll put honey in one and brood in the other, in their natural uh, in their natural brood pattern. So you add new boxes to the bottom of this. That's where this war a hive differs from the langstroth hive as well rather than taking empty boxes and putting them on the top when your bees need more space like you would with the langstroth hive with these you would actually put them on the bottom and the the bees will follow their natural tendency to start at the top and build down let's talk about some of the pros and cons it's designed the pros it's designed more like a bee's natural space like a hollow tree that's upright it uses top bars without foundation this one is also a great candidate for observation windows. You can install them to inspect the hive without disturbing the, disturbing the colony. And lastly, top bars allow for comb honey and wax harvesting. The picture in the middle here is a great example of what an observation hive slash warrior hive looks like. Uh, rather than having to crack it open and bring out the smoker and pry everything apart, you can just pop open a window and look inside, which I think is super cool. The cons. The cons of this hive is that it is also a very niche design. It really is just for hobbyists and enthusiasts, but in, in my mind, I, I think this should definitely go commercial, and I'm actually working on it. 
a design, and we'll we'll see where it goes. I'll update y'all more on that later. But I'm toying around with a war a hive design that might be a bridge between a commercial and a hobby uh, design for this hive because I think it's really important to create a more efficient bee space um, rather than simply simply creating something that is just catering to our needs, like with the Langstroth hive, because the Langstroth hive is very much a human invention designed to meet our, our, our needs, and I think we can find a better halfway point than that. Anyways, I digress. The cons. This hive is not well suited to frame-by-frame -frame inspections. As it's a top bar hive, and there's no foundation, when you take out a top bar, you have to be really careful when you're manipulating that frame and looking at the different sides of it, because if you twist it the wrong way, the comb will detach and fall. Um, you don't have this problem with the Langstroth hive because you've got that nice foundation on it and, and the, the two sides on either end and, and the bottom portion of it. So with the Langstroth frame, you can flip it all over the place and inspect it really well without having to worry about that comb falling off. But with the War A hive and the top bars especially, this goes for the top bar hive we talked about earlier, you just got to be really careful when you're lifting up that top bar because that comb, when it gets heavy, can be delicate and it can detach. Like we talked about earlier as well, top bars allow for comb honey, but they're delicate in an extractor, and it's not an ideal option for liquid honey. So just keep that in mind. You'll probably have to get creative if you do decide to pop these into an extractor and try to extract liquid honey. It can be done. You just got to do it carefully. Let's talk about observation hives. Observation hives are really a broad class of beehives. And the unique part that ties them all together is the fact that they have windows that allow you to look into the beehive without having to open it up. So two of these pictures, the ones on the lower portion, are observation hives that I have built and uh, designed based off of the... Uh, I, I looked at the Beecosystem Hex Hive design. I, I really loved it, but I wanted to make some changes, and so I... I reverse engineered and, and took that design and altered it for myself and made my own version. And that's what these came out to be. And they worked really well. I was very happy with them. Uh, the bottom left is the observation hive that I had in my house. Although I did have top bars in it, like I mentioned earlier, they decided to build it diagonally. And it was still really neat to watch them build it out. It was just not something that I really wanted to open up and take out because I would have to cut comb in order for each bar to come out individually, if that makes any sense. Um, on the right, the lower picture on the right is a fresh observation hive that I built for some friends of ours, and we're looking forward to seeing their bees in there. The difference between the two is that I made the one on the right deeper. It holds eight frames instead of just six, which the one on the right just holds six, and they really outgrew that space extremely fast. So I learned that I have to make that observation hive a little deeper, give them some more room. So still waiting for updates on how well that one works for them. But up here on the top left is your war a hive, and they installed some windows on it, and you can see the nice frames of comb being built out full of bees. It's so, so cool. And this is what makes the, the, the biggest pro in my mind for the observation hive is that they are an exceptional education tool. These are great for schools. These are great for fairs. These are great for centerpieces in your home, that, that for, for conversations, sparking conversation, or just sitting and watching. It's like watching a fire or rain, or um, it, it's, it's therapeutic almost. So that's a cool part, having these windows on. It's also the most diverse type of hive. You will find observation hives in every shape and size you can imagine. Um, that's what makes them fun. It gives them a lends them well to whatever purpose you have in mind for them. These also allow for continuous viewing without significantly disturbing the hive. There are lots of good designs available to choose from online, and these can be filled with bees for a temporary display at an event, or they can be their own permanent hives. So sometimes I've seen keepers who will have a observation hive on hand that's not always full of bees, and then when they're going to a fair or a farmer's market, They'll take a few frames from their Langstroth hive and drop them into the observation hive, and voila, you now have an observation hive in 10 minutes that you can bring just about anywhere, and the, the bees will do fine. For, for you, you, Obviously, you'll want to feed them, but they'll do fine for the couple of days that you'll need them at the fair. Now, the cons to this hive is that 
the primary purpose for these really is education. There's not, these do not have strong production capabilities. Um, it doesn't mean that they won't produce honey. I got about a gallon and a half off of my, uh, my hex hive observation hives, but that was after they had, uh, they, they senesced to, they succumbed to varroa mites and ended up dying and I harvested all the honey out of them. Um, so it was kind of the exception, not necessarily the rule. Another con is that because of diverse and unique designs, the bees' response to that space can vary significantly. So uh, put in simple terms, because these designs are so unique, the bees, the way that the bees fill them out is uh, it's really going to be an unknown unless you have some f frames in there with foundation that's going to force them to build out a certain way. So it can be fun. It can be a discovery process. Or it can be kind of a pain in the butt because they do it in such a way that makes it hard to observe like you want it to. So just keep that in mind. Lastly, and probably most importantly, bees prefer dark spaces. So when this beehive is not being observed, you got to cover the observation window, which to me is kind of a bummer because I like to be able to just walk by and look in and, and then continue on my way. But the light disturbs the bees and uh, kind of prohibits them from building and working like they want to, so cover the window when it's not in use. Those are our different hive types. Some really neat ones to choose from. Just because you're starting a brand new doesn't mean that you're restricted to the Langstroth hive. Um, you can pick any one of those depending on what your, your needs are. But there are some things that you just are going to need no matter what. And uh, the plethora of tools available out there would probably have anybody running for the woods hollering all right so these are what you need this these are the essentials this is what you should start with don't worry about anything else um, if you're going to follow this channel follow follow Exley apiary as i show you how to start beehives these are the tools we're going to use uh, you won't need to worry about anything else the way that i manage hives i only use these these main components the first of which is a smoker all right this is mandatory you can't skip it out skip out on this as as the rest of these tools are i wouldn't include them if they if they were optional um, this smoker is just a canister with bellows on the back and a little chimney on the top and what you do is you build a fire in the canister you'll puff the bellows to feed it air and then as that fire grows the smoke from it will come out the chimney and you can use that smoke to uh, basically distract your bees while you're checking your hive. Um, and if that doesn't make any sense to you, let's let's dive into smoke a little bit. The smoke creates the illusion that there is a fire in the beehive. And the, the bee's natural response to fire is to go and suck up as much honey as they can so they can try to save the save the hive and, and leave without you know without the whole thing going up in flames. So they will run to their honey cells when you smoke the hive, they run to their honey cells and they start sucking up honey. And the hypothesis is that they get so honey drunk or they get so fat that they don't care to sting you you know they're fat and happy or they're just so fat they can't scrunch up and, and stick their stinger in you whichever way it is it, it, it works i'm not exactly sure which one but whenever you smoke the hive it, it calms them down and uh, diverts their attention to saving the honey and their stores uh, what it also does that's very significant is it masks the alarm pheromone that your guard bees are going to put out when anybody or anything breaks into the hive. So that's also handy because um, once that alarm pheromone gets out, the bees will become very defensive and much more likely to sting and it becomes harder to check. So you smoke. As for how to start this thing, that's a world to itself. Um, starting it and keeping it going is going to take a lot of practice, a lot of experimenting. Try the materials that you have available on hand. I will tell you that as a rule of thumb, you have you want to shoot for smoke that is cool. Um, and the reason for that is because if you have a hot fire in your smoker and you're puffing your bees with that, it'll kill them. That heat will come out, come shooting out that chimney, sometimes like a little flamethrower, and it'll burn them up. So use burlap. That's my suggestion. Um, green spring grass also works really well for creating a, uh, a nice smoke. Um, to start out, create a little wood fire in the bottom that's got some good chunks of maybe some scrap plywood. Anything that's not treated 
you want to use raw untreated wood uh, so you don't have any weird chemicals burning in that mix when you're smoking them. And then after you get a small wood fire built in the bottom that's going well and you have some good coals, then drop something on top that will smolder. Burlap smolders really well. Green grass also works. Some folks use sawdust, although that can be a little hot. And if you uh, if you puff the bellows too much on that, it'll get it'll get really hot. Um, other folks use newspaper, wadded up newspaper. Another really great one is cotton. You, if you can find uh, cotton burrs, that it's kind of the leftover from a uh, the, the cotton harvesting process that works really well for a good smolder and lots of smoke, cool smoke. Uh, but those are some tips for your smoker. For for if you use what's local, use what's available to you, and uh, just try it a lot. It's just going to take practice and time to learn how to get a good fire started in it, and uh, learn what you need in order to keep it going for your whole inspection. Because it will die halfway through, and you will have to restart it. So just be patient. It's part of the process, part of the journey. Enjoy it. Next is the hive tool. This hive tool is used for prying, scraping, cutting, and I call it my precision beetle squishing tool um, with, your, <laughs> with your hive beetles. If you are got a big problem and you just see them running around everywhere, I've gotten really good at just using this thing as a point and shoot where I go and squish them on site. Who knows how effective that actually is at reducing their population count, but hey, it makes me feel good. It's a little cathartic. Um, anyways, there's three types that you're looking at here. The one in the middle is actually not a hive tool, even though you use it in your hive. It's a frame gripper. And I, I put it on here because it's a useful sidekick if you just need help really gripping those frames. If your gloves are, are big and clunky and they don't allow your fingertips to get in around the frames, this little, this little tool does a, a great job of, of gripping it firmly so that way it doesn't slip. Because that's what I've, I've got big hands, and so my gloves are bulky. And when I try to fit my fingertips down around that frame to lift it up, sometimes they'll slip, it drops the frame, the bees jolt off of it, and they start flying around, and they're all angry because I just knock their hive around. It's, it's just unpleasant for everybody. So I included the frame gripper in there because it, per, it prevents that. It allows for a nice, smooth lift on that frame. Um, but in order to get that frame out in the first place, you've got to use one of these other two hive tools, the red one or the yellow one, to pry it loose. The bees will glue every single thing in their hive with propolis, and it really is a glue. So the purpose of this little hive tool is to pry things loose, scrape off propolis, and scrape off burr combs, so that way you can get things out to look at them. So you loosen it up with the hive tool first, then you take your frame gripper, and you can lift out that frame nice and easy without brushing it up against the sides of the hive and rolling your queen. So that's your hive tool. Take your pick of whichever one. The, it, I've used both, and I, I couldn't tell you which one I prefer better. I like them I like them both, and I would go with either one. The bee brush is pretty simple. This is just for brushing bees off of the frames when it comes to extracting time. When you're pulling your super off the hive, you'll probably want to smoke it just a little bit, but you're really going to be using this brush to brush the bees off the honeycomb uh, so that way you're not dumping honey and bees into your strainer. Um, but this works pretty simply. You start from the bottom of the frame and you gently brush up. If you brush down, it actually um, hurts them more. you got to brush up in short, swift sweeps. Um, but that's the bee brush. You won't need it immediately, but you will need it for extracting honey. The bee veil is probably the obvious and most recognized part of the beekeeper's equipment. And unfortunately, it's also the most expensive. I was very disappointed to find that I couldn't get any two-in-one like hat and veil combos on Amazon. So when you buy this, make sure that whatever you buy comes with a hat or have a hat in mind that you're going to use because the veil has elastic on top. It can fit around the brim of a, a floppy a floppy hat that you might have or a cowboy hat. Um, just keep in mind that any hat that you provide might have gaps and cracks in it that allow the bees to come down around the brim. I like to use this little plastic um, explorer hat that Daydant or Man Lake provides because uh, it's ventilated and it's also built 
to fit that veil. So there's less gaps for the bees to get in with. Down at the bottom, take note, there's a string. Make sure that your veil that you get has a string instead of a zipper, unless you want to take the time to sew a zipper onto whatever bee suit you're using. Um, but the string, in my opinion, is just more easy to use with whatever bee suit you decide to use. And we'll talk about the bee suit in a second. Because the uh, bee suit's where you can save money. The bee veil is probably where you're just, you just, you're not going to be able to avoid spending uh, like 20 or 30 bucks per piece on it. Bee gloves. These come in all shapes and sizes. I would encourage you to find bee clubs that have a vent at the wrist. Because on these hot summer days when you're checking your hive, you will get so sweaty and it is... It'll be hot work, so find gloves with vents in the wrists. Now, this is where you can save a, a good chunk of money. Bee suits are, are stupid expensive, especially the jump suits that you get and the, the, the jackets and, and whatever. Bypass all of that, go to your local hardware store and just get a disposable paper paint suit. All right, this is what I used growing up, and each of these paint suits would last me about a season as long as they didn't rip. So there's elastic in the wrist and the ankles, and that is really helpful for keeping bees from crawling up your pant legs and into your britches. And then you really have a party going on down there if, if that happens. So uh, I, I would definitely get the paint suit that has the elastic in the ankles and in the wrists. Um, and it's really good for multiple uses. I, I didn't find it tearing apart very easily. It's made out of the same material I think that Tyvek is made out of. And it's 11 bucks at Lowe's. Like, you can't beat that even if you use have to get like two or three in a year. Um, so I would encourage you to go this route instead of going the route of buying a full bee jacket off of Daydant. The other option that I would encourage you to look at is just wearing some long sleeve shirts and jeans. That's really the main thing that I did. If I was checking a mean hive, I would wear this marshmallow suit. Uh, but otherwise, I really was just wearing a long sleeve shirt tucked in and a pair of blue jeans. And uh, sometimes I would duct tape my ankles to keep the bees from crawling up my pant legs and uh, sometimes I'd wear a pair of gloves most of the time my bees were nice enough to where I didn't have to wear gloves so for starting out just because it's going to be a little jittery when bees crawl on your hands or uh, anywhere else go ahead and get some full coverage just so you can be comfortable starting out and and as you get used to your bees and, and learn them and then gradually as things get more familiar to you you can start taking stuff off you can take your gloves off or you can start moving to a long sleeve shirt and some jeans where, until all that you're wearing is the, the bee veil and your and the rest of your clothes. Um, I, I think there's some keepers out there who just do it without a shirt and anything on. And I, I don't encourage that. Just just go with just go with the just go with the bubble suit. So that's all. There's uh, there's three main hive types available. You can choose according to, I would encourage you to choose according to your management goals and your personal personal capabilities. Don't feel like you're stuck with using the Langstroth hive just because you're a beginner. Uh, it's a great, great starting hive, but it's not one that you have to use. Uh, your beekeeping toolbox really only needs a few essential tools, and those are the smoker with fuel. Make sure you always have extra fuel on hand in your box. Hive tool and a bee brush. Last but not least, your bee suit really does not need to be expensive. So, that was lesson three, tools of the trade. Please comment on Facebook with any questions or comments that you have. Next week is lesson four, where we're going to look at honey and money. Basically a step-by-step -step guide on how to extract honey, what that process looks like, what tools you need, what equipment you're looking at. And then we're going to look at ways to make money with your bees, because believe it or not, honey is not the only money maker. So we'll look at some cool ways that my family has made money with bees, um, and we'll go over the, the pros and cons of each. But that's it. Please like and subscribe. Post your questions to Exley Apiary on Facebook. We have a Facebook group. And if you want to support Exley Apiary, do me a solid. I put some Amazon affiliate links in the description below to the tools that we talked about. Order your equipment through those links, and I'll get a little kickback. Comment, like, and subscribe for more. I look forward to seeing you guys next time in Lesson 4.